Okay, let's uh, get started. Uh, as you may have noticed, there's a few empty seats this morning. Uh, some of your fellow students are at the uh, Grace Hopper Conference. If you have not heard of the Grace Hopper Conference, or you have not heard of Grace Hopper herself, there's some uh, obligatory homework for tonight. Uh, go read up on Grace Hopper, otherwise known as Amazing Grace, or Rear Admiral Amazing Grace. Um, and she is the namesake for the conference, the Grace Hopper Conference, uh, which is about women in computing. So we have some of our students away uh, today watching the video. So hello from uh, Raoul Hall. We'll see you when you get back. Okay, let's carry on. Uh, we're going to probably get through uh, Lecture 7 and 8 today. They're shorter lectures, and then we'll move on to uh, information spaces uh, on Thursday. But today is Tuesday, and as always, at the beginning of uh, Tuesday's class, we talk a little bit about the deliverables. Everybody finished deliverable 4? Okay, everybody more or less knows how k-nearest neighbors works, right? So in k-nearest neighbors in deliverable four, we were setting aside our leap motion data for a while, and you were working with a, fl a flower data set, and in that data set, we had 150 flowers, and we were trying to train our KNN algorithm to predict which of three species uh, any one of those 150 flowers belonged to, and what information did KNN use to try and make that prediction? Assuming you got your KNN algorithm to work, how did it predict which of the three species any given flower belonged to? A little bit of botany this morning before we get back to HCI. It took whatever was um, in the candidate of the nearest neighbors and whichever was the nearest neighbor, it assumed that that was the type of the flower. That's it. So that's a good description of KNN, right? We have a point in space, which is the flower we're looking at, and we look at flowers in the neighborhood. And we know what species those flowers belong to. We take the majority. But how, what is that point in space? How do we determine the position of a particular flower in space? What information do we need? It's an n-dimensional space based on the number of uh, attributes about the flower. That's right. So the number of attributes, or for our purposes, we're going to refer to this as features. So we're going to introduce a little bit of terminology about machine learning now. So in the flower data set, we had 150 flowers. And for each flower, we had four features. So we had a four-dimensional space in the case of the flower data set. In deliverable five, as you can probably have guessed by now, you're now going to set aside the flower database, or the, the flower data. And you're going to keep your KNN algorithm, and we're now going to supply it not with information about flowers, but information that you're going to draw directly from your leap motion device. So if we go back to deliverable five here, uh, if we go to deliverable five, um, you'll remember in deliverable three, you were creating this gesture data matrix. Um, when last you saw it, it was a three dimensional. Uh, matrix, a five by four by six matrix, which would store all the information from one frame of data, right? A snapshot of uh, all the bones in the hand at a particular point in time. Five times four times six gives us 120 numbers. We are going to, in deliverable five, turn those 120 numbers into 120 features. So now, instead of applying k-nearest neighbors to a four-dimensional data set, you're going to be applying it to a 120-dimensional data set. Again, not something we can visualize. But now, you're going to, every single frame that you capture from your leap motion device becomes a point in 120-dimensional space. And we're going to try and train in Deliverable 5 your k-nearest neighbors algorithm to predict what ASL digit that gesture represents. In deliverable four, it was trying to predict which of three species a particular flower belonged to. In deliverable five, you're going to be capturing some data for just two digits. And your k-nearest neighbor is going to have to distinguish between which of two digits you're assigning. So you'll notice at the end of deliverable five, there's a, uh, there's a table here <coughs> with everybody in the class, and everybody has been assigned two of the first 10 digits. You're going to be capturing data of yourself signing either 
for example, 0 or 1. So you're going to get a whole bunch of data for 0 and for 1. We're going to feed that into your k nearest neighbors. It's going to plot all of those frames in 120 dimensional space and then try and predict which of the two digits you're assigning, 0 or 1 or 8 or 9 or 9 and 0, whatever two digits you've been assigned. So far, so good? Okay, so we're definitely now going to expand the data set that your KNN algorithm is using. In the number before, you were working with 150 flowers, and you remember that we broke those 150 flowers into two sets. The training set, which was used to condition or prep your KNN algorithm, right? This is like uh, practicing math by doing the problems in the textbook, and the answers are in the back. We know what labels are assigned to the training data. Once we have our KNN algorithm, we applied it to the other 75 flowers, and we wanted to see how well it did at predicting the species when we didn't show KNN what those species were. So far, so good? Okay. In our data set, we have 120 features now, which are all the numbers that describe the positions of the bones in one frame, and you're going to have 2,000 gestures. You're going to have a thousand frames of your first digit and a thousand frames of your second digit. Don't worry, you don't need to sign your digit a thousand times. We're going to do this using the recording mechanism that we prepared in deliverable, losing track now, deliverable two, right? Or was it three? Three, okay. If you remember back to deliverable three, uh, you, you had your primary hand. I'm a righty, so this is my primary hand. And then I would bring my second hand in, which would prepare the recording. And when I leave the frame, it takes one snapshot, right? We're gonna change your recording algorithm so that when the secondary hand comes in, it starts recording frames one after the other. So the moment my secondary hand enters the field of view of leap motion now, it's going to start capturing frame 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and it'll go all the way up to 1,000 and then stop reporting. And that's how we're going to get our 1,000 uh, frames of your first digit, which might be 0. So I might capture 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1,000, 1,000 frames of 0, take my hand back out, sign the second of my two digits, the digit one, bring my hand back in, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, a thousand, done. Now I have 2,000 frames, and for each of those 2,000 gestures, I have 120 features. And I know that the first 1,000 frames, the label, the thing we're trying to predict is zero, and for the second 1,000 frames, the label that I'm trying to predict is one, in my case. For someone, for someone else, it might be seven and, and eight, eight and nine, nine and zero, and so on. So far, so good? Question? That's all right. Good, very good question. So here's a video uh, um, that's embedded in the deliverable to sort of show you what we're looking for. So this is me signing zero. And you'll notice that I'm changing the rotation a little bit, but not too much. We're going to assume, I'll let this finish here. So on my machine, this is about how long it took to get, to get 1,000 frames. Uh, so in this case, we're going to assume um, that all of the digits are signed with the knuckles pointing outward, right? So this is still zero, this is still zero, this is still zero in ASL sign language. But for our purposes, and when you start to do user testing towards the end of the semester, you can tell your users that they should sign everything with the knuckles pointed outward. Why? Because if you train it with the hand in a specific position, then Exactly, right? So we're going to train our KNN algorithm. It might be good at recognizing this. It may not recognize this or this or this unless we give it all that data. So we're going to make things a little bit easier on our KNN algorithm by assuming that all of the gestures are about with the same orientation. I've also included in uh, deliverable five here a picture of the 10 digits. 
Remember that in HCI, we're always thinking about all the context, and there's some physical context here which has to do with the leap motion device itself, which you probably already realize, which is it has problems with occlusion, right? If one finger is covering up other fingers, it's a little bit hard for the machine learning algorithm inside the leap motion device to predict what you're signing. So if you're trying to, if you're trying to sign, for example, six, and you're signing it like this, not only is it difficult for leap motion because you have occlusion here, but your palm is occluding these two digits, and it's much harder for the leap motion device to know that you're doing this rather than this or something else. So we want to make sure that all of the fingers, most of the fingers are visible to the cameras in the leap motion device, and the easiest way to do that is to just tell our users, knuckles out for all the gestures. Okay. You'll notice in the video that I was also rotating my hand a little bit because we want to make sure that the KNN algorithm is robust a little bit to changes in, in orientation. Make sense? Okay. So let's uh, scroll down again to the end of deliverable five. Again, it's pretty long, 47, 47 instructions. It's nine pages long. Start early. What you're going to be handing in this week is a little bit different. You're going to be typing in, uh, like you did in the previous deliverable, you're going to be typing in a few numbers, which is the prediction accuracy of your KNN algorithm for your two digits. So we want to make sure that you've actually captured clean enough data and your KNN algorithm is working and it's able to do a good job at distinguishing between your two digits. And then you're also going to be attaching four data files to your submission. Train M, train N, test <coughs> M, and test N. And if you finish deliverable four, you can probably figure out from the names what these things mean. Remember that you're capturing 2,000 gestures, 1,000 of M, which is your first digit, and 1,000 of N, which is your second digit. Like we did with the flower data set, you're going to take those 2,000 gestures and you're going to train your KNN algorithm on the odd numbered gestures. So your training set is going to be made up of 1,000 gestures. And you're going to test the prediction accuracy on the, text, the test set, which is the remaining 1,000 gestures, which are sitting on the even numbered rows. Okay. So you're going to be uploading those to us uh, next Monday night. What the TA will then do is a week from now, Tuesday morning, he will collect together all of the training and test data sets from all of you, and he's going to put them all into one giant zip file. And when you start next week on deliverable six, the first thing you're going to do is download that giant zip file, and you're going to change your KNN algorithm. How do you think you're going to be changing your KNN algorithm at the beginning of deliverable six? So remember, you're, you're talking about K, right? K equals 15, the number of neighbors. Remember from last time that that determines sort of how well uh, the KNN algorithm does. And the choice of K is kind of separate from the data itself. So we're thinking about the data itself. We're giving you this giant zip file with all of this in there. What are you going to be doing with your KNN algorithm in deliverable six? You can probably guess by now. Exactly, right? So next week, you're going to really be putting your KNN algorithm through its paces to see if it can use all the data for all 10 digits recorded from 63 different hands, right? So you'll notice, obviously, in the 10 digits here, different people are assigned to the same digit. So we have multiple students who are going to be turning in data for digit 0, multiple students for digit 1, and so on. Luckily, we all have differently sized hands. Some of us have jewelry, some of us don't. Some of us are righties, some of us are lefties. We're gonna have a lot of data, but we're also gonna have a lot of diverse data, right? We started this course by talking about the fact that people differ and that makes things challenging for HCI. You're gonna to get to experience that firsthand, no pun intended, next week. 
Okay. A couple more uh, notes about, uh, about deliverable five. Uh, I promised you that we were done using uh, new libraries in uh, Python. I kind of misspoke. We've got one new one that we're using this week, which is Pickle. Has anybody used Pickle before? A few people? Okay. So Pickle is nice because as you probably experienced in previously, previous deliverables, sometimes it's hard to read and write files because they're being written in different formats and it's, it's a bit of a pain. Pickling is, uh, the Pickle uh, library is nice because it'll take any arbitrary data set or, or data structure, like in our case, our NumPy matrices, and it'll pickle it, it'll compress it, save it to a file uh, using uh, dump, and then load will just read that file back in and restore the data structure in the way it was. You don't need to manually reconstruct that data structure. So if you write, uh, if you create in Python a dictionary of dictionaries and you pickle it and you load it back in, when you load it back in, you'll have a dictionary of dictionaries. If you pickle a 3D matrix, a 3D NumPy matrix, and then you read it back in, you'll get a 3D matrix. So it's all sort of in the same the same format. So we're all going to be switching over from using NumPy's load and save to pickle uh, load and dump so that when you turn in your data files at the end of deliverable five, we have 63 times four files that are all in the same format. Okay, so this is really important that we get this right the first time because the TA doesn't have a lot of time next week to collect everybody's data sets and put them together in a zip file. So make sure that it's pickled in the right format. So pay careful attention to the instructions that describe what is actually going into train M and train N and so on. First thing the TA is going to do when he, uh, next week is read in your file and use pickle.load and it better come back in the right format or we can't include your data in the overall data set. Okay. I think that's all I need to say about Deliverable 5. Any other questions? No? Okay. So back to lecture. Um, we are uh, narrowing in on the end of our theme on design. We're going to spend two short lectures here, 7 and 8, on the design process, how to actually go about testing your HCI software. And then we'll end uh, on Thursday probably with 9 and 10, a discussion of information spaces. Before we get to seven, uh, we were on the last slide of lecture six last time where we were talking about um, visual design and how this can be challenging. And I introduced you at the end of last class to the, uh, to the, Netflix, uh, the Netflix prize. Um, unfortunately, the million dollars is already won, so uh, sorry you can't enter next time. Um, big challenge at the beginning of this competition was to download these massive data sets and actually start looking for pattern in the data. You had a few minutes at the end of class last time to talk about it. How might you start to visualize some of the data in here to help you get started on understanding the problem and then hopefully winning the million dollars? Probably a good place to start, right? So the thing that your machine learning algorithm, when you design it, is going to be predicting is zero to five stars. So let's create a histogram and see what distribution there is, right? If everybody always gives every movie five stars, then your machine learning algorithm is going to be pretty simple, right? So there's probably a bias in there. I don't know what it actually is, but it's probably not an even distribution of zero through five stars for movies. So you might start to think about biasing your machine learning algorithm towards predictions of the most common kinds of ratings. What else? You remember we ended last time, I showed you one of my previous experiments where I visualized some data and it turns out there were some subtle patterns in there that weren't seen using other visualizations. So the team that won the Netflix prize actually did a lot of this visualization and analysis and there were sort of subtle patterns that they found that other teams weren't aware of and then the winning team created machine learning algorithms that exploited those sort of subtleties in the data. 
So what kinds of visualizations might you create to go looking for some of those subtleties in this data set? Um, rating by ID number. Rating by ID number, right? Is there a relationship there? Are there certain users that tend to give very high ratings or low ratings? Maybe that, maybe that matters. Rating by, if you go and look, it's interesting that depending on the day of the week, there are higher or lower ratings. Oh wait, no, I guess you don't get to see what genre it is. What genre, yeah, you can't tell what genre it is. You know the title. You could again go looking then in other data sets to go looking for genre. You can sort by year of the movie. Okay, perhaps. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Is there is there a relationship between the age of the movie and rating? Right, we could start to compare pairs of variables to see what sort of predicts or what correlates with rating. And if we start to see a pattern, that might be a variable that we want to give to our machine learning algorithm. Uh, yeah, maybe based on like the last movie or the last couple of movies, if you did watch a lot of movies. Absolutely, right? So remember that in the data set that your machine learning algorithm is going to use for the test set, you know the customer, you know the date that they provided the rating for. So you could go back into the training set and see what was their last five ratings, what movies were they watching. Maybe that's, maybe that's useful. Right? Again, who knows, but this is the kind of game we would want to play with the visualization process before setting our machine learning algorithm loose on this massive data set. Okay, I think we'll leave, that, we'll leave that there. You can go and read up on the challenge itself. It was very interesting. Let's uh, change gears again now and come back to the design process, not the philosophy, not principles, not rules of thumb, but how do we actually go from a human desire and need to a product or service or app or combination of hardware and software uh, and so on. So you might remember a few lectures back, we drew this sort of star pattern for the design process. This, we're gonna use this uh, as we move forward through lecture seven and eight here. This particular design process has clearly user testing at its center which is a little bit different from uh, more traditional software engineering. We talked about the waterfall method where you start by writing down some requirements, you start to write some code, you do some internal testing, deployment, and then repeat the process. In HCI, you tend to make small improvements or, or small movements towards the product or service and go back and test with your users, make a few steps forward, back to evaluation, and so on. What does that actually look like uh, in, in, um, in practice? Well, typically there are sort of four activities around this central user testing process. Prototyping and envisionment. So envisionment is just to remember that we want to try and make ideas visible. We just finished talking about visual design. A lot of HCI is trying to pull out of our users things that are unsaid or unknown and make them explicit so that we can then write them down in our requirements and make sure during testing that we're meeting those, those requirements. Okay, um, conceptual design. This one is sort of packed analysis. So what are sort of all the things, all the people and things that are gonna be affected by or affect the system that we're in the process of designing? Right? So who's going to use the system and who might be stakeholders, people that aren't actually going to use the system but might be impacted by it? Are they going to be using this technology indoors or outdoors? Right? What is the context of this technology? Is it going to be used by many people simultaneously? Is it sort of a one-on-one -on -one interaction between one person and an instance of the system? Who, what, where, when, uh, why? but not the how, right? The how is written in the requirements, okay. And then finally, the physical design itself is the how. We start to create prototypes in the final system, okay. So that's sort of a, a sketch of the design process, but we're gonna start with scenarios, which is where the idea came from in the first place. So scenarios tend to be a set of stories that are starting to emerge from a particular group of people 
that want to do something but they can't do it well. So um, what does that look like? Well, for example, we have a whole bunch of people that want to try and find a, a common time to meet at a university, right? Again, this is kind of an obvious one. There's lots of scheduling software out there at the moment, but even in these scenarios, we start to hear this common need and it's gonna to start to influence our thinking about the technology to support uh, that need. Okay, so um, as we're developing our scenarios, as you'll see in a moment, we're gonna move back and forth between the specific and the general and move back and forth between the technology and the human needs. And we're gonna do that to try and make very explicit the human reasons behind any design decisions that we make, right? So we might create a scheduling software where its main, uh, its main defining feature is that it highlights overlapping periods of free time. So if you ever played around with a doodle poll or when is good, all of these scheduling apps, they tend to have that as a central feature. It's very easy when you look at a visualization that's emerging from people putting in their schedules to doodle poll or when is good, you very quickly start to see where there are overlapping times uh, of free time because that's why you're using a scheduling software, right? I don't particularly care when any of you have a class. All I care about is that you have free time that overlaps with my office hours, right? Everything else is irrelevant. So a big part of scenarios, as you'll see in a moment, is stripping away the ir irrelevant from all of these stories and focusing on the part that matters and then turning that part into code or hardware. <laughs> So we're going to look at the process of building up these scenarios, starting from the left, where again, as we've done many times before now, we're starting with a sort of mass of vague material, which in this case is going to be user stories. It's really frustrating to meet my professor for office hours. I can never find where his office hours are posted. Never, it never seems to line up. It takes a lot of effort to find the TA and uh, meet with them for office hours, right? There's, you can hear the frustration in there, you can hear sort of this vague need, but we need to sharpen down exactly what needs to be done to solve this frustration. Okay, so user stories, I wish I could do X, or it's really hard to do Y. We're gonna abstract away from a bunch of these stories, all of the differences and irrelevancies that don't matter, we're going to build this down, or we're going to compress this down into a conceptual scenario. So this is going to start to sound like requirements. The user will be able to easily schedule uh, office hour time with their instructor or TA. Once we compress that down to a conceptual scenario, then we can start to generate, we can decompress and come up with different concrete scenarios, different uh, potential technologies that would solve this problem. The user will be able to do X using technology Y or app Z, or alternatively, the user will be able to look at a piece of paper that's posted outside the instructor's office or what have you. It doesn't necessarily have to be a high-tech solution. Once we then look at these alternative solutions to the problem, we pick the one that makes most sense, and we turn that into a use case which is a very, very specific story. You often see a use case, uh, uh, figures associated with the use case, where we have actors and stakeholders, we have different tasks, we have different pieces of technology, and then we can say, for example, actor A conducts task uh, X using device Y. Sometime later, actor C also performs task X using device Y, and so on and so forth. So we're starting to sketch out a very specific use case now um, that's gonna be supported by that technology. Okay, let's look at a little cartoonish uh, example here. We have two user stories. The first one is from a female atmospheric scientist. Uh, she reads journals X, Y, and Z and pulls out atmospheric data from the Amazon rainforest. She types in the data manually from the journals uh, and puts colored pins into a map of the rainforest uh, in her office. The color of the pin tells her what data was collected and what data it represents. She's frustrated by the lack of real-time data. No kidding, this seems like a very old-fashioned way to, to do this. Nonetheless, this is how she does things. 
Second, uh, a second user says, I'm a male uh, high school teacher and I try and impress upon my students the effects of deforestation. I tell them the statistics about how the rainforest is disappearing per day and what effect that's having on the region and the world. Um, again, not surprisingly, the students don't seem to respond too much to this dry statistical lecture, but they do respond to images and video. Okay, again, kind of a cartoon example here. What do these two users have in common? And what is the common sort of need or desire that we can pull out of this? And what are the irrelevancies that we can throw away? They both want more data about the rainforest. They both want more data about the rainforest. Yep. More specific? Um, there's different kinds of data that each one has that are useful. Okay, so maybe they both want data from the rainforest, which raises a question, how much overlap is there in the data that, that we, they want, right? The scientists might want some very specific data where everything is geotagged and temporally tagged. They know exactly where and when the data was collected. Maybe that's not so important at the high school level, right? Maybe at this level, they're just looking for engaging comment, content which will engage the students, right? So they definitely want better data and maybe real-time data or some, some sort of video, but maybe the overlap ends there. I think they both want like a graphical interface. Okay. One person is using a map, the other person is just telling statistics. It, Exactly. So a graphical user interface might help both people. We're going to talk about that when we get to concrete scenarios. We're trying to hold off any decisions about the technology yet and really focus in on, on the P and the A and the C. What is it that they want, right? And then we can think about how to, how to support that. What are some other obvious irrelevancies here? I threw a number of them in here. What probably doesn't matter here? Gender, right? For leap motion, it does matter, right? And you might not have realized that up front, but it turns out that male and female hands, on average, tend to have average, uh, different mean sizes. It's going to matter next week when you tackle deliverable six, because you're gonna be training your KNN algorithm on hands from uh, different genders, some people with rings, some people without. It does matter. In this case, probably not, right? So again, the black art of HCI is sometimes it's obvious which what matters and what doesn't. Sometimes it's not, not so easy to tell. Okay. All right, so uh, let's sort of compress this down. Um, users will be able to log into a website. I apologize, we shouldn't, probably shouldn't mention website. That's a technology. We wanna push that to the concrete scenario. But the users will be able to dot, 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 do something. They're going to have access to distributed real-time data from the Amazon rainforest. That looks like something that's common to both. Uh, the data will be collected automatically from different sources in the rainforest and in integrated into some common format that will be usable by the scientists and also usable by the high school class. Uh, the data will be presented in a variety of ways. We're still not sure exactly about the overlap between these two users, so let's create different visualizations and project this data uh, in different ways. Let's make sure that some of these visualizations are animations because we know we want people to be engaged and as well as actual photographs of situations on the ground. So we're sort of compressing this down into a conceptual scenario which clarifies the requirements. What must the system do? And again, as we've already seen now, these conceptual scenarios and even the user stories themselves start to suggest different technologies to support them. What are the different ways in which this particular set of requirements, this conceptual con scenario, could be instantiated with technology? How would we go about providing, uh, how would we go about providing distributed real-time data from the Amazon rainforest? And one of the most important things is we need some way to gather Absolutely, right? So there's nothing in here yet about gathering the data, just that that's what we're going to supply to meet the need. So now we're starting to get into concrete scenarios, right? We're going to have to collect that data somehow. What are the different ways that we could collect that, that data? There was that thing that we talked about a while ago with the uh, independent data collecting. The independent data collecting from the rainforest, right? So way back when we were doing packed analysis, I said, how would we collect 
data from the rainforest, and then I said the rainforest canopy, right? We were talking about uh, dropping wireless sensors into the canopy of, of the rainforest. So how exactly are we going to go about collecting that, that data, right? This is going to be pretty, pretty important. Somebody mentioned GUIs already. That's, that's important. We're going to have some sort of graphical interface. Maybe we're going to create something like Gapminder with a slider bar so we can see forward and backward in time how things are changing in this particular part of the rainforest and so on. Okay. So again, just this is a cartoon example. I've sketched out two different concrete scenarios here. One in which the data is going to be collected automatically and one in which the data in the rainforest is going to be collected uh, manually. So two very different scenarios. They definitely have their pros uh, and cons. This is a relatively high-tech solution, but has a lot of issues as well. How are we going to make sure that all the sensors stay charged? Uh, how are we actually going to deploy them? Gets a little tricky. Maybe we want to go with a, a less low or a more low-tech solution. We have local people and villages in that part of the rainforest uh, deploying the technology for us going and changing the, the batteries or checking on the solar panels every week, uh, and so on. Okay, pros and cons, we might go back to uh, the funding agency that's gonna pay for this whole thing to start with. We might go back and talk to the scientist and the high school teacher and say, listen, we've got these two ideas, which one sort of makes sense for you? Maybe in this cartoon example for our users, they don't really care as long as the data is coming back. Maybe for uh, our funding agency it matters because it's an issue of cost. Okay. Let's assume we go with option two, where we're going to have local representatives go and actually deploy sensors or collect the data manually. Then we can move on finally to uh, start to sketch out a use case where we have a better idea now about our stakeholders. So there is not only the scientist and the researcher, uh, we, and the educator, but now we have sort of local government officials, people that are going to do the deployment or actually help with the collection of the data. The government official might not actually be using the website where the data is presented, but they're now part of the process, right? We then might start to sketch out some user stories. The government officials go out and collect the data and it gets pulled into some sort of data store. We then start to write out some requirements about this data storage. How is this going to be done? We've got groups in two very different countries, so the cloud probably sounds like a good solution here. Um, once we have that data collected, how are they actually, how's the researcher and the educator going to actually access the data? The researcher might want access to the raw data itself. So we might create a Python and NumPy interface where they can actually access the raw data in addition to a front-end GUI that we develop, the educator and his students, they're probably only going to deal with the, the front-end, the GUI. Right? So now we've got some very specific pieces of technology. We can write down requirements for them and start to actually prototype this, this system. So like we've done before, we move from left to right, where we're moving from things that were relatively vague to things that were pretty specific, getting into actual Python libraries here. But in practice, you sort of move forward and backwards or from left to right along this trajectory during the, during the design process. What might cause you to move backwards, away from a concrete scenario or use case, back towards a conceptual scenario or a user story? You hit something, you hit some kind of setback, maybe. Yeah. Absolutely. You might hit a setback about something that doesn't work. What might that setback be? Okay. Possibly, right? So maybe there's some additional costs beyond what you had read, um, um, originally imagined. Government officials may not agree or have the funding for whatever project you want to make available. Absolutely, right? So funding, uh, human resources issue on the on the uh, collection side. Let's swap out our cartoon example here with the rainforest and swap in the deliver our HCI deliverables. So next week. Let's say the use case for next week is, here's the idea, we're gonna take everybody's data, put it together in one big data set, and you're gonna train your KNN algorithm against it. That's a concrete scenario. We're gonna have a zip file, we're gonna use KNN, which is inside of uh, Scikit-Learn. Got a pretty uh, concrete idea. 
um, use cases. You're all going to record data this week. You're going to upload it next Monday night. The TA is going to download it, zip it together, and then you guys should have no problems with deliverable six. But in the process of saying all that, it occurs that there's a problem, a, a, an assumption in there that's going to make things not so easy for all of you next week in deliverable six. What's the assumption that's flawed in this? Everyone's code works. Everybody's code works, right, exactly. So are all those data sets actually correct, right? Maybe some of the data is corrupt. I've made an assumption in the deliverables about something that is irrelevant, which may in practice turn out to be relevant. What is it? What are actual hands are like? What your actual hands are like, right? So there are 63 of you that, assuming everybody finishes deliverable five on time, will have 63 data sets. This is a computer science class, so we know that the mi minority of those data sets are going to be from female hands, and the majority are going to be from male hands. We have enough females here that maybe it won't matter. In previous years, it did matter. If you remember back, or you go and look at the visualization in Deliverable 4 about the flower data set, if there is a small number of outliers, then those tend not to be neighbors for uh, test points, right? So if we have a small fraction of the data, which is different from the majority of the data, that can make things harder on KNN. For now, I'm assuming it won't matter, but maybe it will. So maybe if I think about it, uh, maybe I say, listen, I think the way Deliverable 6 is set up is a little bit flawed. Maybe the gender balance in this class does matter, and I'm going to go back and rewrite Deliverable 6. Or sorry, I'm going to go back and rewrite Deliverable 5, which is when the frame is captured, we're going to normalize the size of the hand. Remember that you're capturing 120 numbers that represent the 3D coordinates of the bones. We could add in some normalization code that would shrink and grow all the hands, all the frames, so that they're all about the same size. We could actually put that in the code and try and normalize size, which would maybe make things easier on our KNN algorithm. Right? So I'm backing up for my use case, which is me actually starting to write the instructions for deliverable six, assuming that gender balance doesn't matter. And after having thought it through, maybe it does. So I'm going to go back and start to rethink how this whole thing works, right? So it may be that something that seemed to be irrelevant turns out when we start to sketch this out in detail that it does matter. So we go back and rewrite the conceptual scenarios and rethink the technological solutions, the concrete scenarios, by turning that irrelevancy into something that may be relevant. That might be a reason that we go backwards. When do we know that we're ready to move forward? When are we ready to leave conceptual scenarios and move on to concrete scenarios or move on to use cases? What might happen during any of these four procedures that would cause us to move towards the right? Jack? There's some sort of agreement in your team on what the next step should be. There's agreement in the team. Maybe, again, we pull in our users. Remember, we're doing user testing all the time. So we might pull in our users and ask them, say, does this sort of make sense? And we might have experts who know something about collecting uh, data in remote parts of the world. Yes, the funding makes sense. Yes, this technology is simple enough that it should be uh, charged by solar panels. This all makes sense. Um, the team agrees. The stakeholders agree. So let's move forward to some actual prototyping. Let's actually deploy a few sensors in the rainforest and start to do a few rounds of actual prototyping to see if this, this makes sense. Okay, so in HCI, the design process, it's usually not unidirectional. We're usually not going from a bunch of frustrated users to a final product, product and never going back. We're flowing backwards and forwards, but we need to think carefully about why we're changing direction. Otherwise, you kind of get lost, right? You're floating back and forth along this timeline, never making any, uh, along this pipeline, never actually making any progress. Okay, so this is sort of the beginning of the design process here. We're taking these sort of 
user frustrations and starting to sketch out uh, solutions using scenarios. And that's lecture seven. Let's move on to lecture eight now. Now that we have a pretty good idea of what we want to try, we're going to start to do some actual prototyping and some envisionment. Like we just saw with scenarios, usually you create a series of prototypes, and the first ones should be as low-fi, low-fidelity, or basically as cheap as possible before we actually wade into writing software, making hardware, how can we actually prototype this? In a lot of uh, design houses that are building interactive technologies, they do a lot of stuff with paper and cardboard. A lot of things is just sort of mocking things up to see how they work. Um, they might do stuff with cardboard. They might then print, 3D print a plastic prototype if there's hardware components. Um, people will write some very, very simple Python scripts to go along with it. You try and do as much uh, cheaply as possible before you actually start to build actual software uh, and hardware. Sometimes you're creating a horizontal prototype, and sometimes you're creating a vertical prototype. If you're making a brand new system like Leap Motion or something that's kind of exotic that people aren't familiar with, you might want to sketch out sort of the main functions first and play around with those. You might, at the early days of Leap Motion, they might have taken two IR cameras and just kind of put them on the desk and waved their hand over it and looked at the actual camera images, right? Oh, wait a second, there's some occlusion going on there. I wonder how our system is going to deal with occlusion. What happens if I bring in two hands? How does that work? So they're sort of playing around at the top level functionality of the system before getting into the nitty gritty details. In the case of Leap Motion, the nitty gritty details might be what is the machine learning algorithm that takes pixel values and translates them into 3D coordinates, right? That's getting down into the weeds. Even before we start to do that, how did these two infrared cameras work? Could we get away with one infrared camera, three? How does this, how does this work? Alternatively, you might be developing a new app which does pretty much of everything else that other apps do, but you have one new piece of functionality in there that no one else has. So maybe you want to do some vertical prototyping, right? You want to focus on building up a prototype of just that novel function that your app is going to supply. Okay. Usually, again, if there's a team doing this, you have a front-end team and a back-end team. The back-end team is starting to create, for example, the machine learning algorithm that will translate pixel values into 3D coordinates. And while the back end team is doing that, the front end team is working on the interface, right? So you remember the visualizer app that shows the skeleton hands? Maybe they're sketching out with pen and paper what that visualization is going to look like, right? Assuming we have 3D coordinates from the hand, how would we show that to the user? Maybe in retrospect, it seems obvious. You're going to draw something like a skeleton hand, but maybe it's not so obvious. This is usually preceding the back end. The back end takes weeks or months of coding and debugging. Interface design can be pretty, pretty quick. Okay. However, this leads to kind of a chicken and the egg problem, because if you start to have a good interface sketched out, but you don't have the back end, how do you test this with, with your users? What you'll often do is sit the users down in front of these lo-fi uh, prototypes. And the simplest thing is storyboards. And storyboards are basically just another word for use cases. So where scenarios end, that's where prototyping picks up. So we might start to actually sketch things out on pieces of paper. And if we had more time, we'd play this game in class. You'd actually pull out a couple pieces of paper, sketch a novel website, where on each piece of paper you have a particular pa web page of your site. And when somebody clicks a button on a piece of paper, you swap in another piece of paper, which is the screen they would see if they pressed that button. Right? It takes all of about six minutes to start to draw and sketch that out, and all of about two minutes to test your website with your user. No code, no tech, uh, no computers, no nothing. Pen and paper, right? Super simple. And if you play this game, you'll realize that often you learn a lot from your users before you've even written a single line uh, of code. OK. Here's a simple storyboard of a, kind of a silly drawing program where you pulled something through a magic hoop, and it would spray paint onto the image as you go. Um, you can sort of storyboard something like that. 
Okay. So uh, storyboards, pen and paper prototypes. Then you get to what are known as Wizard of Oz uh, prototypes. So you now maybe write up a simple script, or uh, you might even create uh, a set of slides, which are the various web pages in a, a website that's being de delivered, uh, developed. And you have the Wizard of Oz in the background, which is when someone presses on a key. There may not even be a key there. There might just be a place on the screen where they touch. The Wizard of Oz in the background will swap what they see on their, their screen. So from the user's point of view, it looks like they pressed a button and something actually changed automatically, but it was a developer in the background basically running the show. If you're not familiar with the movie The Wizard of Oz, The Wizard of Oz was always hidden in the background and making things happen in the, the foreground. Again, it's a relatively cheap thing to do before you actually have the back end, but it often doesn't get the timing right, and often that, that matters. If you have a human in the background that's trying to switch what the user sees as they interact with the screen, they're probably not going to get be able to change things as quickly as an automated process actually would. Okay, then we get to a script-driven prototype. So a little bit of the back end starts to be built out. So you might start to attach little scripts to different parts of your interface. So when a button is clicked, it'll bring up uh, a pop-up window that gives some information. So you're starting to automate something, but the full functionality of what would actually happen in the full system when that button is pressed, that back end isn't there yet, but you're starting to put it in there. So you start to build the interface, the buttons, the slider bars, all the other interactive elements, and you attach to it separate scripts. They might be Python scripts that just pop something up on the screen and say, coming soon. When you actually use the slider bar in the full version, you'll see the animation sliding back and forth or what have you. Right? And then in the final, uh, in the final step, obviously you have the full, the full system. Okay. So again, we're moving from left to right, from vague to very concrete to the full system. But there are a lot of assumptions built into this which is that usually you're storyboarding screenfuls of two-dimensional data, discrete data. We have one web page, then another web page. Um, doesn't really take into account the user's uh, act uh, activities and context. So as we start to move into ubiquitous technology or embedded technology, where we have technology embedded in the real world with us, it's not as obvious to think about how to storyboard and create cheap prototypes of systems that are embedded in the world. Okay, so again, you can tell this slide is a little bit dated. Uh, when Google Earth was brand new, how would you go about storyboarding that? A lot of websites or a lot of, a lot of technologies these days are continuously changing, showing 3D data, for example. What about Leap Motion? There's another one. It's embedded in the world. How would you storyboard um, an educational system that teaches people ASL digits? Right. This is going to be your final project. How do you start thinking about that? I was going to say for Google Earth, you could essentially storyboard it based on mouse functions. Okay. Like exactly, right? So you sketch a little map and somebody clicks a button or does this on the screen or does this on the screen. What happens next, right? So the data or the visualization itself might be continuous, but the interaction with it might be discrete. Someone touches the screen or they don't. Somebody performs a recognizable gesture or they don't, right? So that, that might work. It might tie our storyboard to discrete interactive events. When we get to leap motion, there are some discrete events, like a secondary hand enters the field of view and leaves, but there are also continuous events that are occurring. How would you start to storyboard educational software that teaches ASL digits using leap motion? Okay, well we're starting with what it does, right? Is it projects, the cameras are turned on, that's T0 all the beginning, so that's good. It's 
tricky, right? It's, not, it's hard to sort of break this down into discrete events. Easy with a website, right? Somebody clicks that button or they, they don't, right? If somebody's waving their hand over lead motion or we deploy an autonomous machine that's sort of doing its own thing continuously, not so easy to break this down into discrete interactive events. The first time my hand is detected? Exactly. Turn on. That's it, right? So we can sort of focus again, if we have a continuous system on the first time that an event occurs and the, the, last, the last moment when that event is uh, terminating and so on. So we can start to try and identify some of these discrete events and build a storyboard around there. Okay, just something to, to keep in mind. Let's, uh, we're gonna end lecture eight here by focusing on the central component. We're not gonna talk too much about the other three uh, now, user testing, right? What does that actually mean? And you're going to get a, a taste of this when you test your device with your flatmates at the end of the, the semester. If you put it in front of them and they use it, they finish using it, and they look at you, what do you want to know from your user, right? They'll usually say something like, oh, that was cool, or I had no idea what I was doing. Did this thing even work? What is this for, right? Typical questions like that. How does that help you, right? You're getting feedback from the user, but when you design a user test scenario, you're gonna design it so that you pull out of your users as specific information as possible, right? This was fun, or this was frustrating, or this was boring. It's kind of helpful, but can, can we get them to be more specific? Okay, so when we're doing testing, we're going to focus on measurement. Can we turn words into numbers? What are we going to try and measure? And what are those measurements going to tell us about how to go back and fix our system so that we better, uh, fit, that we better support user needs? Right? User needs have precedence over requirements. So we've written down during our scenarios and prototyping uh, exercises what the system should and shouldn't do. We try it out with the user and we realize they're more frustrated than they were with when they started. Maybe there's some fundamental assumption in our requirements or our scenarios that's flawed, so we back up and rewrite the requirements and make sure that we focus on user needs. And in order to do that, we want to make sure that we're evaluating as early as possible. Right? You don't want to do weeks or months of coding and testing internally before exposing it to your users, and then the first words out of their mouth make you realize that there was some fundamental flaw in your assumptions. But if we want to evaluate early, how do we evaluate early before we have a full system? That's what we just finished talking about, right? Coming up with creative ways of creating cheap interfaces that we can expose our users to uh, early on. Okay. Uh, much of the evaluation is done in the designer's head and is informal. Um, as you're writing your code, as you're developing it, am I doing this right? Um, another aspect of the black art of HCI is as you're developing your system, you need to mentally put yourself into the shoes of your eventual users. By the time you get to the final project and you're building your educational software, you're going to be a leap motion expert. You're going to know exactly how to move your hand to get leap motion to uh, recognize your hand. You're going to know that this doesn't work and this doesn't work, this doesn't work. You already, you now have a mental model, you have an understanding of this technology that's gonna be very different from your users who have never used a leap motion device before. So you're gonna to have to try and remember as you're creating your final project, what was it like when you first used leap motion? And make sure that your software is supporting that kind of user. Okay. So that's sort of the informal mental evaluation that you're doing, but we also want to tr try and do formal evaluation. Give the system to a user, don't say anything, watch how they use the system, and extract measurements from them, quantifiable data that you can use to isolate where you need to make improvements in your prototype. Okay, so let's unpack this evaluation process um, before we do the user testing or evaluation, we need to establish the aims. What are we actually trying to get out of giving this system to our uh, roommate for five minutes? Is there, is there a point? Do we want to see, is the system going to crash? Can they actually, are there any bugs that 
their interaction with the system might pull out? Or do we want to see how quickly they figure out what to do? What are the actual aims here? Um, what's being evaluated, why and by whom? Um, and what metrics are going to be used? And we'll talk about metrics in a moment. If we're doing this at a large scale, we might have experts come in who actually know the demographics, the people, the context, the activity, um, before we actually bring in the users themselves. The experts might help us design our user testing scenario, but who counts as an expert? We plan our user testing, we sharpen how we're actually going to do this, then we make sure that we pull as wide a base as possible during testing, right? Um, if uh, gender matters, we want to make sure we have males and females in our testing pool, okay? Combine results from our different users, analyze those results, and use the analysis to guide the designers. You need to go back and fix this part of the system because this particular part of our user base are being, uh, are being excluded from, from the system. Okay, so let's actually play around with this uh, about actually measuring this. You may remember when we talked about non-functional requirements, we went through 12 of them. Non-functional requirements are sort of the global properties of the system above and beyond the specific function that it supplies. So, functional requirements. Our system should teach our users uh, the first 10 digits of the ASL language. Non-functional requirements is we should make the interface visible, we should make aspects of the interaction visible so the user figures out how to sign their first sign without us having to tell them how to do it. That's a non-functional requirement that has to do with visibility, right? As they learn the digit zero, they should learn the digit one in the same way, right? You don't want to change the interaction for every new digit. We want to try and keep things consistent. How are you going to teach the users each individual digit and make sure that you repeat that process for all 10? We want the interface to be familiar somehow. They're dealing with an unfamiliar technology, so what aspects of web pages, video games, uh, what are some things that might look familiar on the screen that'll help them get started with the unfamiliar hardware component of your, your system. What are affordances? Exactly, so can I include some affordances that advertise what the user should be doing, right? It's kind of related to visibility, but this one specifically is something on the screen that is saying you can interact with me in this particular way. I gave you the example of all these different quote unquote chairs. They're not chairs, they're things that afford or advertise the act of sitting. Can I draw something to the screen that advertises this over the device, right? Or this over the, the device. So let's take these 12, uh, let's take these 12, again, relatively vague things and come up with a metric, a number. We're gonna put our system in front of our users. They're gonna do something. And we're gonna collect a number. We're gonna measure something that gives us back a set of numbers that tells us how well or how poorly these things are being done. Let's start with visibility. We create a proto you create a prototype of your educational software, you pass it to your roommate, you don't say anything, and they use it for five minutes, you bring it back, and you recorded some numbers that tell you how visible or how invisible your system was. Was there enough on the screen that got them started, and how would you know? What would you actually measure? Time. The time it takes to, so time is good, let's be as specific as possible. To like start the program. How long does it take from turning on the program till the first frame of data is captured from the device? How long until someone finally gets their hand over the field of, of view, right? Again, we're not telling the user anything. You pass them the computer and the leap motion is just sitting there next to the, the computer, right? Okay, so time in seconds until the first frame is captured, right? That's a very specific number. And in order to speed that process, we may be putting something on the screen, right? Maybe an animation of a hand 
coming over the device, right? Or this, the hand on the device and a big red slash through it, right? Don't do that, do this. Okay, what about some of the others here? What are some of these other non-functional requirements and what are some metrics that might help you determine how well they're being implemented in the system? Not always an easy thing to do. Style would have to be like some non-quantitative number. Like it must be like, this is like cool, or like <laughs> I enjoy this. That, that one's really tricky, right? So again, in HCI, we have a mixture of objective and subjective, right? Is, is it stylish? Is it you know interesting to the person? Maybe the, it, this is going to be a hard thing to quantify. Maybe we give an actual verbal uh, survey, and we get information that way. We can always give a survey, but sur surveys are boring. Better to collect data using the system you already have. Time in seconds until the first frame is captured. Okay, here's one I came up with visi for visibility. Um, on any website or any app, um, the number of times that people have to access the help page or the FAQs or anything like that, that's usually a bad sign, right? People hate to read the manual these days. Um, that might be something else that helps you measure visibility. Let's focus on affordances. So I create an affordance in my educational system that's trying to advertise something I want the user to do. How well, to me, that affordance looks brilliant. It would be obvious to anyone that it's advertising a particular interaction. I give it to my user, get it back, and I measure something. What would I measure to know whether the affordance is working or not? The success rate of the affordance, so let's be specific. I can't associate a number with success rate. Let's quantify it. How many times the user does whatever your affordance is? I know exactly when that affordance is being flashed on the screen, how many seconds, for example, for example until they do the thing that I'm trying to advertise. Okay, here's my attempt at an affordance. Okay, so I just saw someone do that. That's pretty good. That took about two seconds for someone to do it. You're doing that with your forefinger, which is wrong. So I got one correct and one incorrect interaction. It's supposed to be a thumb, right? Which some people notice and some people don't. So, all right, 50-50 for that one. Okay, so again, we could quantify, right? Did someone actually touch it with their forefinger? If we're using leap motion, luckily we know what, which finger they're, they're using, right? So did they rotate it counterclockwise, right? That one's pretty obvious, but maybe not. So maybe some people rotate it clockwise. We can quantify that, that information. Okay, again, you can play this game yourself. Sketch out an, an affordance, show it to a friend, and see if they do this, right? Does it actually work? Okay, so let's say we start to associate or we start to assign particular metrics to particular non-functional uh, requirements. For example, if the system is familiar, we, we wouldn't collect a lot of unexpected interaction uh, results. Uh, new icons interacted with correctly on the first try for affordances. And we start to get these numbers back. And we start to get these numbers back from more than one user, right? That's important. So we might start to then do some statistics on the combined metrics we're getting back from our users. So what happens, for example, is if we have a particular metric associated with feedback. So feedback is if I do something wrong, um, the system will tell me and it will help me go in the quote unquote right direction, whatever that means. Don't worry about what the metric actually is, but let's say whatever that metric is, our users are consistently scoring low on that feedback, uh, on that metric. What does that tell us? How does that statistic guide our improvement of our prototype? What part of the system do we need to fix? Whatever part is um, causing the low scores. Exactly. Whatever part is providing the, the low scores, right? Maybe in this cartoon example, it's obvious. It's the feedback part of the system. It's the pop-up messages that say, are you sure that's what you wanted to do? I think what you really want to be doing is dot, 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 
right? So that in this simple example, it's pretty easy to take a, a uniformly low-scoring statistic and isolate where in the prototype the problem is occurring. <clears throat> it's not a bug. Your program is working perfectly fine, but you were failing the user in a particular way, right? It's a different form of debugging. Okay, let's say we have a separate metric for uh, recovery. So if the user does something wrong, the system provides a way for them to back up, right? Um, and everyone is able to quickly and easily back up when they make a mistake, however we're measuring that in our system, right? Number of seconds to correct a mistake, or number of seconds uh, in which the user recognizes they made a mistake. Whatever the metric is, everyone's scoring uniformly highly, Great, okay, no problem, we can move on. What happens if we have a particular metric, like the one here for, uh, for constraints, where we have large variance? Some users are scoring high on that metric and some are scoring low. What might that tell us? We're subconsciously helping one group over the other. Or maybe we just got unlucky, right? Some of you went like this and some of you went like that. Maybe it's just confusing, right? Some people are lucky to figure it out. Some people are unlucky to figure it out. We should still go back and improve that. But it might also be telling us that there are certain groups that are having a problem over others, right? And we talked about that quite a bit at the beginning of this course, right? We want to make sure that our systems are accessible to all members of our, of our group. Are we alienating a group? Often high variance in user testing will tell us that. Young users have no problem with this particular metric. Older users have a problem. Why, right? Maybe it's font size. I never realized that the font size is very small. Older people have a hard, harder time of visual acuity. Maybe it's the font size. How do we actually go back from this high variance and this difference in our demographics to isolating where the problem actually lies? Okay, uh, that ends lecture eight. We have four minutes left, so I wanna move on to lecture nine. I apologize, I haven't posted lecture nine yet. I'll put it up after class. We'll just spend a couple minutes starting in on lecture nine, where we wanna talk now about information spaces. So once you start to create a novel technology, like the Leap Motion Educational System, or Google Earth, or the internet itself, you're creating a space through which your users are moving. They're learning more digits of ASL. They're finding their way from point A to point B in Google Earth or Google Maps. How do they come to understand this new information space that you're creating? Okay. They do that by obviously you providing an interface or view onto that space, right? So the information space has some sort of conceptual structure in the background. The internet, as the name implies, is a huge network, a web of nodes and links, and different browsers, and today apps, all provide slightly different views onto the same space, the same underlying information space. The way you create a particular view onto that space depends on the P and the A and the C. What is the person trying to do with that space? Okay. User interfaces have been around for a long, long time. We're not going to talk about them too much. Um, first came command-based user interfaces. Some of you using Macs are being forced to work at the terminal um, for the deliverables. This might be your first time working at the command line, um, but it's good for you. This is the old way things used to be done. Um, then along came graphical user interfaces, um, somewhat tongue-in-cheek known as WIMP interfaces. They all have windows, icons, menus, and pointers. These interfaces are so obvious today, they don't even need a lot of uh, discussion. They're made up, though, of these, again, these different views on the same underlying system, information space, which is your operating system. You can interact with all the files and folders in your operating system at the command line, which gives you a particular view onto that space, or a GUI, which provides a different view onto that space. Now we're starting to see tangible interfaces which require manipulation of physical devices which have an impact on that information space, such as, for example, uh, Leap Motion. 
We'll look next time at a tangible interface called React Table, and I think we'll leave things there for now before showing that demo. Uh, you have a quiz due tonight. Please get started on Deliverable 5, and I will see you on Thursday. Thank you. Yeah.